Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Kate Flanagan, and I'm a member of the CAA board and the steering committee for the Columbia Alumni Leaders Experience. I want to welcome everyone, our alumni and students joining us from across the globe this morning, afternoon, and evening. When the Leaders Experience Steering Committee conceived of this five-week worldwide conference, we wanted to provide some opportunities for the broader Columbia alumni community and the student community to have exposure to some of the content we provide for alumni leaders each year. For me, the most impactful thing about being a Columbia volunteer is the opportunity to meet the most intellectually curious, diverse, and socially conscious people in the world, other Colombians. I've forged lasting friendships with alumni from all over the world and from schools at which I had previously not known anyone else. The Columbia Alumni Volunteer Community is rich and inspiring. Hopefully, if you're not yet involved with the CAA or your school, programs like this evening will inspire you to do so. Stay tuned at the end of the program for some additional resources about the topics and uh, we discussed and some upcoming programs we have in the following weeks. This evening, you're in for a treat. We have with us three of the world's most influential journalists who have covered so many of the most significant historical and human events of this generation. Matt Bai, Jody Cantor, and my fellow CA board member, Natasha Levadeva. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to participate. So without further ado, I'll kick it over to our moderator in South Africa, where it is well after midnight, Zoe Rumushio. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, this time last year, we were all on Morningside campus, and I'm sure a lot of us were wondering how the event would work out this year. Uh, but I'm really grateful to Ken, the CAA team, um, and the steering committee for putting together such a global experience. As Kate mentioned, I'm in South Africa right now, it's 1 a.m., but I'm joining all of you. And we're also privileged to have an incredibly powerful panel who'd usually be in the air somewhere, um, you know, chasing a big story. And But we have them here with us um, this morning, this evening, uh, this afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Um, I know you've all read the impressive bios. So in the interest of time, I just want to say welcome to um, my fellow J schoolers, Matt Bai, uh, most recently of the Washington Post and um, Natasha Lebedeva um, of NBC News and uh, college alumni, Jody Cantor of the New York Times. So welcome to you. Um, our panelists, and thank you so much for taking the time out to be here. Um, great, thank you, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is that um, being a Colombian is being part of a family. Um, and I know there's a lot of important issues that we wanna delve into and unpack. Um, you know, we wanna know about what's eroding public trust in journalism and how true journalists can lead us out of this moment. But first, you know, we want to get to know you, you know, as people, as, you know, part of the Columbia family. And I think one of the questions a lot of us would ask is how um, each of us had that moment when we knew that journalism was our calling. Um, so maybe if you, I mean, that, you know, if you could each um, tell us a little bit about, you know, that moment for you, um, we could start with you, Matt, and then Natasha and then Jody, if we can just go in that order, because Zoom gets a little bit awkward sometimes when it's like, uh, uh, you know, we don't know. So I'll just give you guys an order so that we're kind of comfortable. So Matt? Sure. Um, I'm still waiting for that moment. I'll let you know. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, Zoe, thanks for doing this at one in the morning. If, uh, I, uh, if I'd known, you know, you were going to be up because that late there, I would have started drinking hours ago to make myself you know, <laughs> tired. Like, but um, <laughs> it's fun to see you all. It's great to see uh, old friends and, and Jody and Natasha here too and, and everybody in the, it's always good fun to be part of the Columbia community. So thanks for asking and, and for doing this. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I, 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 it's a tough question. I always, I'm not, I'm really not good at very many things in the world. That's the truth. I, I don't, I have a very narrowly uh, focused person. So I, I think I always knew I wanted to write uh, and I and I think I always I always love news and I always love politics and history and so I thought journalism was largely largely uh, always going to be my profession but I drifted away because I think and I think that's a healthy thing when you're young 
um, and you try things. I was actually a speech writer after college. I worked for UNICEF and, wow. um, and worked, wrote for Audrey Hepburn and other folks. And it was, a, it was just a weird experience of trying, you know, doing something different. It was a terrible time for newspapers. There was really nowhere to work. And uh, I guess the answer to answer your question is I went to uh, in a very long time ago. I'm not going to say how long ago because it makes me super old. I went to Liberia <laughs> at the tail end of the Civil War there uh, for UNICEF and spent about a month. And I um, came back and realized, no, I, I, I definitely was, was meant to be a journalist. I definitely was meant to write about things. And, and that was sort of a crystallizing experience for me. Is, um, and, uh, and, and that was when I decided actually to go back to Columbia uh, to for graduate school. So, uh, you know, I, I guess my point, being, I, th I think it's, I think it's good for journalists, especially, and for everybody to sort of test out um, other paths and other routes and, and, and figure out who you want to be. But, but for me, I realized pretty young that um, some form of journalism, some form of writing was, was, was what I was supposed to do. Hmm. No, that, that's, that's actually, I think a lot of my colleagues at the J school have had like a career beforehand, you know, people have come from medicine, from different, I think it always brings like a lot more richness to the experience. And I think that's what makes coming to the Columbia J School such a, such a great, um, I guess a great experience because you meet people from different backgrounds um, as opposed to just people in one um, track or profession. Um, Natasha? Um, yeah, for me, um, I think I just, fell into journalism. I never wanted to be a journalist or never thought I would be a journalist. Um, I grew up in Russia and um, uh, went to the university there and got my master's degree in mathematics, actually, and applied mm -hmm. linguistics and worked in that field. And then there were turbulent 1990s in, 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 in Russia, like Soviet Union was changing to, you know, falling apart and becoming Russia. And um, uh, there were not so many jobs available in any fields uh, that would pay. And um, I, through a friend, was invited to help CNN um, of its coverage uh, of all these numerous coup d'etats that were happening back then. And mm -hmm. um, so since I learned English at the university in, in St. Petersburg, uh, they hired me and um, I was working with like real journalists of CNN covering these amazing life-changing events uh, in Russia with when people had a lot of hopes and things were just literally happening in front of your eyes. And um, I remember standing, you know, downtown Moscow with the tanks passing by and all this, you know, turmoil and things happening. And CNN reporters were reporting live from there. And it just came to me like the realization, oh. you know, the history has been made in front of my eyes with all these visual images reported by TV journalists. Um, so I ended up working for CNN and uh, then applied to Columbia and then uh, later was recruited by Newsweek uh, in Moscow and then I applied to Columbia from there and um, decided to explore, you know, like how journalism works in, um, you know, in the West versus, you know, journalism in the East. So mm -hmm. that's my experience. So, but I had, you know, a different career in mathematics and then just happened to be at this place um, in life um, in Moscow working for CNN when it just dawned on me what power journalism can have. Wow. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's incredible. Literally history being made in front of your eyes. That's, I think that's everyone's dream and particularly with COVID. <laughs> um, a lot of us who were at the journalism school this year were like, what is going on? Like, you know, everybody was trying to like, crystallize and try and trying to like put it together like because you could tell that this is a big moment so I guess a lot of journalists get made when you know the world is changing the way it is right now um and Jody so um I was a journalism junkie who I think was actually afraid to try journalism professionally if I go back to my uh Columbia years I inhaled newspapers and magazines. I read the Times every morning, you know, whether it was like, I remember um, my best, one of my best friends at Columbia is named uh, Franklin Ford. He's a journalist now at the Atlantic. We became friends sophomore year and we were inseparable. And when we were seniors, we would take the train down to study at the New York Public Library's main branch. We thought we were like too cool to study in the Columbia libraries. And um, that year we decided to get each other Hanukkah gifts. And I, I 
Um, I thought I found him such a great Hanukkah gift. We were in, I was in the gift shop of the New York Public Library and I saw a poster that was a cover of the New Yorker magazine and Frankie loved the New Yorker. So I thought I would get him that poster. And when I gave it to him, he actually looked crestfallen and he said, I don't wanna hang a New Yorker poster on my wall. I wanna write for the New Yorker. And I was like, I think part of me was like, who do you think you are? You know, even though I uh, was at a school like Columbia, for me personally, um, the notion of making a transition from being a reader and a consumer of journalism to being the person who actually wrote or edited the stories seemed inconceivable. It seemed like almost narcissistic, like, oh yeah, everybody's gonna wanna read my stuff. Yeah, I got this. Um, so lo and behold, I did a couple of fellowships after Columbia and then I went to law school at another university that won't be named. And um, halfway through that semester, I had an epiphany. I had, I think it's the only epiphany I've ever had in my life. It was like a literal three in the morning um, epiphany. And I said, I wanna, I wanna drop out of law school to be a journalist. Um, my clips were so bad that I couldn't show them to any potential employees. Um, but I was just able to, I just, there were little tells and little clues I had. Like I was the one who edited all of my friend's grad school essays. I helped like someone win the Rhodes Scholarship. She wrote, she had written this terrible essay and I fixed it for her and then she got it. And I, I was just, you know, even as a student, I was always in a state of flow uh, when I was just rearranging words on a page. And so I think something in me, you know, sort of knew um, I could do it. Uh, and so I dropped out of law school to become a journalist at a very young Slate magazine. It was like a two-year-old startup. And really within a week or two of getting there, I felt that I had found my home in part because I like journalists so much. I'm married to a journalist. My friends are journalists. Um, you know, and what I, I, think, I think what I like about being around journalists um, is that journalists are really curious people. Journalists are just interested in other people and interested in the human experience. And I think that's something that uh, journalism has in common with a great university. Mm. Mm. Yeah, wow, that's, that's like a, that's a really powerful story when, you know, you had an epiphany and I think it's, it's definitely a calling and one of the things that we want to discuss today is, you know, how, you know, public trust has been eroded and basically the profession is kind of under attack at this time. Um, but I'll start with what's on everyone's mind right now, um, whether you're a U.S. citizen or not, uh, we're a week away from the U.S. presidential election. And we have most mainstream media outlets reporting on fears of voter suppression, possible Justice Department interference and a looming Supreme Court shutdown. And you know, outlets that are more friendly to the administration um, are playing up on the whole voter fraud and the push to have people become self-appointed polling place monitors. Um, how does this play out in the media leading up to the election and in ensuing weeks? Because I think people definitely want to hear um, hear from 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 you guys. That's one of the things that was top of mind and one of the major questions. Um, so if we can start with uh, the other way around, Jody, Natasha, um, and then Matt, I think if you can freely just jump in and just speak about that. Zoe, I feel that if we could answer your question, we could save the American people so much agony and confusing confusion in the next two weeks and perhaps more to come. You know, I think, I think we don't know the answer yet. We can project, but When it comes to election night and the days afterwards, are we going to be in essentially an information nightmare, you know, in which a chunk of the country thinks there was one winner and then the other chunk of the country thinks there was another winner and simply like the, the basic truth and agreement of where the ballot, you know, who voted uh, for whom, uh, you know, how the ballots stand, et cetera, et cetera. Is that going to be yet another thing that our country can't agree upon? 
Mm. Or, um, you know, or are we going to have, you know, a, a, a landslide for Joe Biden, which some people are, pro are still projecting, um, you know, and just like a sort of, you know, wilder and more 2020 variation on, you know, what we think of as election night uh, predictions. Uh, you know, so I can't answer that. I mean, I think journalists are in a, are in sort of a, a, a state of, you know, anticipating, waiting, you know, investigating, but, um, but, you know, there are so many possibilities in terms of what could go wrong, both at the ballot box, and then both in terms of how those things um, are represented. But I think there's another way to look at it, which is that presidential elections reveal so much, right? I worked, I covered two presidential campaigns for the Times. And it's a way of, you know, taking a snapshot of, of where the country is at at any given time. And I think that, I think it may be the case this year that as much as our sort of information um, economy says a lot about the election and who will win, I think it's also the case that the election is gonna say, so much about what's wrong with our information economy. And I'm thinking of a story that my colleagues Davy Alba and Jack Nikas had in the paper yesterday. Some of you, if I were sophisticated enough to put a link in the chat, I would do it. Maybe I'll try. But essentially, so here's the headline. The story appears in the paper yesterday. As local news dies, a pay for play network rises in its place a nationwide operation of 1,300 local sites publishes coverage that is ordered up by Republican groups and corporate PR firms. And you sort of have to see the pictures that go with the story because the essence of the story is that there's this huge sort of out of nowhere network of um, things that, that look like traditional publications. They, you know, they look like newspapers, they have headlines, they have stories. And they have names, they have these like generic newspaper names, like the Maine Business Daily, but they're not actually newspapers. They're this sort of Republican pay to play operation in which mm. PR consultants and political operatives pay to have stuff that looks like news distributed instead. And so, you know, when I read this yesterday, I just thought, a, this is, you know, this is a fantastic story. And B, this is like, this is a distillation of what we're up against. You know, this thing, it's so clever, right? Looks like a newspaper. It feels like a newspaper. It has yeah. all the beloved accessories of newspaper, you know, that we have grown up with all our lives in terms of newspapers. And yet, uh, and yet this is really uh, something totally different and, and not to be trusted. I mean, I think you're, you're going into the question that we had next. So Natasha, if you could touch on that. Um, the question we had that came through was what role has social media platforms played in the erosion of trust in factual journalism? Um, can you comment on that and add on that? Um, what, I'm sorry, would you, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. Um, what role have, <laughs> What role have social media platforms played in the erosion of trust in factual journalism? Um, I mean, in my opinion, um, as you know, Judy mentioned, there are so many now publications and mm -hmm. social media feeds and everything that people try to rely on. Um, and uh, um, a lot of times it's just, um, you know, some created um, artificially, um, you know, meme or statement or information that has been spread around the social media. And I think a lot of this mis mis misinformation is actually um, nowadays coming from, um, you know, the White House and the Republican National Committee. Um, and uh, then it's been spread on social media and then sometimes even mainstream media picks on that. Um, I think there was a recent um, study by Harvard University that indicated just that, that um, a lot of um, you know uh, misinformation that we are uh, that is the biggest threat to the uh, coming elections, not the cybersecurity, but the misinformation uh, is coming directly from um, you know from uh, President Trump's campaign and the White House, um, and um, uh, it's very hard to determine which um, 
you know, like what is true and what is not, especially if you are not uh, politically inclined and a media savvy person. So you just see the social media feed, which is which gets retweeted or uh, shared, and um, um, people t t people tend to believe that it's true when in fact is it's complete misinformation. And um, um, then you know, like if you compare it with the coverage for by the mainstream media, then I think people get confused and lost where the truth is and. Uh, um, as you said, like then, like where is the public trust in the media? Because nobody knows who reports what and where the factual information comes from. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that's that that's that's very valid. And I mean, what I'd love you to touch on, Matt, is I know you've also covered is it three um, presidential campaigns. This is my uh, sixth. Goodness gracious! Your bio <laughs> needs to be updated. Your bio needs to be updated. Not. <laughs> So this is your sixth. I mean, can you comment on, you know, um, how the current president and his administration continuously deride uh, news outlets? You know, this is un has been unprecedented in American history. Uh, what do you believe is the root of this uh, demonization of the press um, that reports news unflattering to the administration? Right. Uh yeah, so this is the six that I've written about, um, uh, but obviously, you know, the weirdest and, 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 the, and, you know, I used to be much more on direct, uh, directly covering campaigns than I have writing columns the last couple of cycles, although I guess now no, not many people can be very direct, directly involved anyway. Um, well, the root of it is uh, that it works for him. Um, and there is a, it's a larger conversation. There's a, it's just a strong uh, current that's been growing over 20, 30 years in American life of anti-establishmentism and anti-institutionalism. And it's why Trump succeeds with his base whenever he goes after the leadership of an institution, whether we're talking about the head of the NFL or the Pope or the media or the generals or the intelligence agencies. Uh, he has shown us in a sense something I think a lot of us didn't grasp before uh, he became president, which is that uh, you really, you really can't, there's a segment of America in which, uh, for which you cannot go wrong attacking the leadership of institutions. Um, and the media obviously has been a big part of that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I maintain, I've said many times, I've written and I maintain that a big part of Trump's appeal with his constituencies have nothing to do with ideology or celebrity, although that's a big part of it, but had to do with the fact that no matter what he says, uh, you know, no matter how outrageous it is, um, it infuriates us and we jump up and down and we feel powerless and we scream and yell on cable TV and on co and columns like mine. And we talk about how uh, infuriating it is. And I think that's gratifying to a lot of Americans who have felt powerless and who have disdained the media to see us so exercised and powerless uh, in turn. And, and I think it's why, you know, I think a lot of Americans who support Trump don't support the things he says. They don't like him personally. We see that in polls. You know, that's pretty convincing. Uh, but they do like the fact that he, he's such an irritant and an antagonist to the institutions that they disdain. And we are chief, chiefly at the top of that list. Um, I'm a big believer, having said that, in controlling the things you can control in life and in politics and journalism. And we don't control what he says and what he does. We control our reaction to it. We control what we do to earn and retain, and in some cases recover the trust of the public. I wrote a whole book about you know where I think the roots of that are, uh, but I think we've done a lot over the decades to squander the public trust that we had. And I think oh. there's been a reluctance to take stock of that with Trump because the feeling is we're always defending our mission. And if we're admitting any wrongs, then we're not doing a good enough job of defending ourselves and the nobility of our profession. But I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we can defend the nobility of our mission and also admit that we've gotten things wrong and that we've contributed to this moment. We've contributed to the rise of a president like Donald Trump. And we have to think about, because we have to reckon with that and think about how you retain that public trust, you know, how, how you go about rebuilding it. And, uh, and also, I think I'm very concerned that in this, during this Trump moment, we have become the opposition party, the opposition media that he has always said we are. And I'm concerned that you can't hit reset on that, that you can't go back, that much of the public now sees us as a partisan entity, that we behave on front pages and op-ed pages like a partisan entity, 
and on and certainly on TV networks. Uh, and I don't know how you dial that back. And I'm worried about it because I think no matter where people are on the ideological spectrum, they will trust us less if we uh, essentially cede any notion of objectivity, which still has value. Um, and I think that's going to be a challenge mm. going forward. Mm. I mean, I think on the issue of objectivity, that's something that we were discussing a lot um, this year, especially during the protests um, that happened earlier this year around George Floyd. You know, objectivity became an issue of, you know, um, at what point do you, as journalists, stay objective? And, you know, um, we saw a lot of journalists getting arrested and attacked for doing their jobs. Um, and, you know, I, I'd like any one of you to, to just comment on this. Um, there's a few who actually still have charges against them from during the protests, you know, and this is something where it's like, it's becoming very clear, like, you know, there's people on this side, it's become very, um, binary in terms of like who's reporting what. Um, so I, can anyone comment on this on, in terms of the protest particularly? Sure, I'm happy to because I actually think it goes with your last question, you know, which, hmm. is, which is about why Trump attra att attacks the press as much mm -hmm. as he does. I, you're right that it's, um, it's very scary to live through. We've, you know, we're seeing an environment for journalists in the U.S. that's much more like environments we're used to seeing in different countries with lower standards for press freedom. Um, there's, you know, our colleagues have been called terrible names at political rallies. Uh, you know, people have been physically attacked at protests and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, I think there is a level of fear in uh, in the business that, you know, that I didn't grow up with, that I didn't, I, that I think most of us didn't experience um, mm -hmm. earlier in our careers. Natasha, coming from Russia, you may have a different perspective. But I think that ultimately the reason why people try to undermine reporting is that reporting is so powerful. We hold the powerful to account. It's our joy and privilege to do so. That is you know, mm -hmm. people have asked Megan and I where, whether we were scared during the Harvey Weinstein investigation. And we would say, are you kidding? This is why we get up in the morning, the chance to <laughs> confront somebody <laughs> like Harvey Weinstein. That is like our greatest motivate. That's our idea of a really, really, really great day. But make no mistake, the information that we dig up is often really threatening uh, to people, mm -hmm. to people in power. I think that's been true with my colleagues' investigative work on Trump for years. It's, I'm a member of the New York Times investigative team, and it's been mm -hmm. a joy and a privilege to sit next to people like Suzanne Craig and Russ Butner and Mike McIntyre and watch what I think has been a four or five year journey from mm -hmm. you know, the first shreds of you know, uh, Trump's tax uh, information to really you know, getting uh, you know, the full recent ret returns. And it was, it was such an incredible statement to a, a sitting president of the United States, which is essentially saying, you can't hide this crucial information from us. You, you know, you tried to, and we got it anyway. Um, and, you know, there was, um, there was a scene um, in the book that Megan and I wrote about the Weinstein investigation that, that really, I think, speaks to this quality. It's, it's in the first chapter. Our book is called She Said. And while it's, it's mostly like the behind the scenes story of the Weinstein investigation, it actually starts with a lot of Trump stuff in the first chapter because Megan had been one of the first reporters to bring women on the record with allegations of sexual oh. misconduct by mm. by the president and it talks about you know her her experience there as a kind of um precursor so she relates this is really megan's part of the book but i'm gonna play my partner for a sec and relate it um you know she's she starts talking about this evening in the fall of 2016 uh when she's got this is around the time of the access hollywood tape and she's got these mm. two women who have never spoken publicly about um allegations of assault by Trump and they want to go on the record and she's getting the article ready. You know, they're, they're getting closer to publish. Megan, by the way, is like, I don't know, 
five months pregnant or something. She's sitting at her dining room table in Brooklyn and they go to the Trump campaign for a response. You know, this oh. is a, this is just a sort of routine thing in journalism. If you're, especially if you're going to present damaging information about somebody, you give them a chance to have their say, to try to refute it, to include their response, their apology, whatever. So she sends this email to the Trump campaign as one does, and she expects to get what like, kind of a canned reply. Instead, yeah. she's sitting there, and Donald Trump calls her uh, cell number, and she's, you know, she's she's all of a sudden like presenting these allegations and trying to hear what he says and trying to type, and uh, he, you know, he dismisses Access Hollywood as locker room talk, and then he starts to erupt at Megan, and he he starts attacking her. You're disgusting. You're a disgusting human being, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out that at that moment when Trump was on the phone with her, he was in the wings at a Florida campaign rally. And it was interesting to see what he said at the rally afterwards. He, he kind of goes to work taking like all this energy in the crowd and directing it against journalists. And his quote from that rally is, the corrupt media is teamed up against you, the American people. I'll tell you what, it's libelous, it's slanderous, it's horrible, and it's really unfair but we're going to beat the system. This is a month before election day 2016. And also remember that at the time, it looked like the Access Hollywood stuff and these allegations were gonna be extremely damaging to him. It's still, you know, it's still sort of, I think, a great question of American political history, why it, why it wasn't, why it didn't prove more damaging. But anyway, I think in that scene, I think in that pivot from him being on the phone to, with Megan to talking to the crowd that way about journalists, you can see why politicians, and not just Trump, by the way, I mean, Trump is an extreme example, but this has, I think, been true of politicians for a long time. It's sometimes true of Democrats. I think it's why they direct, uh, they try to direct anger and mistrust towards us mm. but the mm. same goes to I mean, people and you know as we started with the protests and you said like um, journalists are arrested it comes from uh, journalists being labeled as enemy misleading fake news old names horrible names horrible people you know you are sleeping eye you are you know like whatever you know trump called different yeah. quarters his nickname for everyone and then you know it sifts through to the public and uh, to the you know, police that, uh, that that were you know involved in the riots. And um, we heard so many stories from my colleagues, and I'm sure you heard from your colleagues who were covering protests, how mm. people were attacking them with the same kind of language. And um, you know, like the rubber boots were used against them when they would say they're press or journalists. It didn't mm. help. Like people and police together we're saying we don't care you're fake you are misleading you are like not reporting the truth and um, you know we don't know what you're doing here uh, and the language and attitudes comes from you know from um, from uh, from up there and I think uh, yeah. it just I mean this kind of um, narrative um, is uh, pretty recent and um, you know it was created by uh, the White House in a way yeah and I mean, Natasha, if you can expand on that, we can see that this isn't just an issue in the United States. Are there parallels that you can, you know, um, tell us between what's pre presently occurring in this country and in other countries? Um, I know that's, you know, your forte working with a lot of foreign administrations. Are there parallels that you can draw for us, um, particularly um, in the... You know, I, I worked in a lot of, um, you know, totalitarian or, you know, like re regimes countries, so to say, and there mm -hmm. it's mostly like censorship of the media, you know, like media is not evil, but it's censored, you know, and you cannot report anything which goes against the, uh, you know, party line, so to say. Uh, you cannot speak out against the government and uh, everything, you know, goes along, you know, one line, basically. Um, but um, in most of these countries, people just don't know, you know, better. And that's the only li line they know, so they, um, they don't think about the journalism it's just more like information and news that are coming their way uh but i think uh you know what currently is happening here in the united states you know with all the misinformation and using fox news and some public radio stations as um, you know party press for, for or campaign press for president trump 
it's in a way the same kind of like censorship. You just have one line, you know, misinformation you're presenting, and then you don't allow any other views to infiltrate it. And you try to stop this other news as fake news and, um, you know, enemy of, uh, of the people. Um, so it, it does remind you of totalitarian, you know, censorship of the media, like in a way, you know, if you make this kind of connection there. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we've got a couple of good questions in the Q&A section, but Matt, I wanted to just, you know, I thought this was a really important question. Does the free and fair press have any recourse against news outlets that either patently mislead the public or offer opinions rather than facts? Uh, more importantly, what are the consequences for the public good through omissions of reporting contrary to the facts? And how are such news outlets and their employees held accountable? Well, um, I think I understand the question. I mean, we have a problem, right? In that um, there are, there's been a tremendous democratization of information and a fracturing of the media market, which is, by the way, just a reflection of everything happening in the society. If it's music or uh, any kind of culture, Hollywood, where I spend a fair amount of time these days, you know, it's, it's every, all markets are fractured. Um, and so, you know, there isn't the one place where everyone goes anymore. And so as a media, we're going through that. And predictably, I guess, but, but really disturbingly, an awful lot of people are going to media sources that uh, sort of confirm their worldviews and make them feel better. And a lot of it's not true. And so we're trying to figure out, I think we're wrestling as a society with what we're going to do about that. And there's this argument, you know, just now in the last week or two, about you know what the responsibility of Twitter is or what the responsibility of Facebook is, and I, I I have to tell you I'm you know I'm conflicted about that because on one hand I certainly think it's a responsibility of a platform to uh, to not knowingly or to make an attempt to not knowingly put up false information, misinformation, be used by governments or used by demagogues like our president, uh, and he is a classic demagogue. At the same time, I worked for a tech company. I, I, I had a great time. I don't particularly want tech companies deciding what we can and can't see. Uh, and I'm not sure they're the perfect arbiters of truth or the perfect referees mm -hmm. of truth. I'm not saying they won't try hard. I'm just not sure I want a bunch of engineers becoming the gatekeepers for what passes the test of uh, consumable. So I think ultimately the answer to this um, is, is going to be, ultimately some percentage of the population are going to believe what they want to believe. Mm -hmm. And for a large percentage of the population, uh, you know, how we handle this moment and, uh, and we meaning sort of a more mainstream traditional established media uh, and how we go about uh, preserving that trust and, and being really careful about it is going to be important. But ultimately, it's going to also be consumer driven. And, you know, I don't just put it back on people, but and I know people take an awfully dim view of the American news consumer, but um, media literacy in this country is going to be super important teaching kids from a young age to be more discerning. And I think, you know, is going to be really important. Yeah. And, and I think, um, and I think they get that. Yeah. You know, the other thing is it's important to remember, I'm not, I'm not often accused of being an optimist, but I, I think it's important to remember that we're at the very beginning of this. You know, this is the wild west of social media. This cycle looks remarkably different than four years ago. Four years ago looked light years from four years before that. I mean, I've seen this transition. We all have. So, you know, my kids get it. Um, you know, they don't believe everything they see when they turn on TikTok videos and, you know, it's not perfect. There are things I think they should believe less, but you do have yeah. a generation native to social media platforms who are going to bring a different sensibility to all of this. Um, mm. and I, and, and that makes me, you know, I think they're, I, I think we are going to evolve in ways that aren't entirely problematic. Uh, but I do think we have to keep pushing the idea and keep pushing this, the message that you can't. Uh, it is not uh, civically responsible or in your self-interest as a citizen to only get the views that you already have and to only find the people who will tell you that what you believe is true. And that's going to be a long, repetitive process. And by now, it already sounds like a cliche, but it's just critically important. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've got a question from um, our audience from Chagun Chopra. So I know you kind of touched on it, Matt, to say, you know, we don't want to put everything on the tech companies, um, you know, and that, you know, it's consumer responsibility as well. But his question was, what 
can tech companies such as Twitter and Facebook do to combat uh, the spread of misinformation? But what he particularly asked for is like, what would your wish list be? <laughs> so I found that quite interesting. What would your wish list for tech companies be? Like for them, what would you like them to do? Hmm. Is that for me or, or can I pass it off to someone? I mean, I, I you know, I don't, um, you can pass it off. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Cause I don't run. I mean, that's the truth of the matter is I don't run one of these companies. I think it's incredibly complicated for them and for us. And like I say, I think there's a couple of sides to it. I mean, I think at a minimum, I've heard politicians say this, who I, you know, and I think it's true politicians who I agree with that you, uh, at a minimum, you can't be providing content to that many people and take an absolutely, um, a, 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 an abstaining view and just say, you know, an abdicate and just say, you know, I'm just a bulletin board. You're not just a bulletin board. So, um, so you do have to have some system uh, for pure misinformation and manipulation, but I, I would be fairly conservative about it. I don't think we want content police or thought police. I think there's enough thought policing out there all, all around. Um, yeah. I don't think ultimately we want to put the onus for this on the companies who run these, uh, these networks. I don't think we want to we want to single them out and say this is your problem. You fix it, because I don't think we're going to like the fix. Mm. Mm. I mean that that's yeah. I'm that's 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 fair. That's a fair response. Um, and I want to take a second question from um, our audience, which is how do you how do we revive balance in the media? Um, so much of what we read seems to be written to purposefully stoke fear in an apparent desire to draw eyeballs. Unlike in the past, um, I actually need to read the sources since they are so often mischaracterized. Uh, this trend clearly undermines journalism. So how do we revive balance in the media? Any of you can jump in on this one. I mean, these are big existential questions but <laughs> i took the last one so i'm 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 gonna, I'm gonna pass that <laughs> no balance in the media is, is i mean it's hard and like when you look at the mainstream media that we sort of represent right uh we have our checks and balances and standards and legal departments and everything um you know i can vouch you for what we put out basically because it's so many layers of uh, of fact checking information and what language to use and uh, like what kind of like you know things you are expressing uh, there um, so I think it's more like balanced but um, you know other numerous you know websites that Jody mentioned for example you know that appear out of the blue and uh, publications and um, you know social media um, I don't think you can con control them but it's more a fact of um, you know, um, uh, as, as Matt said, media literacy, you know, that you can teach people, I guess, you know, and uh, how to um, how to have an eye for what, um, you know, the opinion is versus what the balanced reporting is, you know. And as journalists, we all know what this is, but I think the public needs to be more educated on, in, in that matter, how to distinguish between, you know, balanced and uh, opinionated, you know, steering to one direction reporting you know you always like check what the sources are what you know in the reading of the materials and where they come from and um you know like who like where the facts are you know collected from and things like that uh but i think you know to have a balanced um, overall you know coverage of the news it's it's hard you know like because um, apart from mainstream media and major networks and established newspapers, um, you know, the newly appearing websites and everything, I don't think, think they have any like journalistic standards that we um, are used to and uh, were taught in the journalism school. Mm. I, I mean, I, I have a question here from Joe, um, Joel Mandelbaum, which I think leads on nicely, perhaps he says, perhaps a significant reason for the perception of journalists as partisan rather than detached observers is the appearance of so many reporters from the Times and the Washington, Washington Post on CNN and MSNBC, where they freely express their personal views. Um, I mean, I think that brings us back to, you know, objectivity, which is something that we, I, I said, we were discussing rigorously at the J School 
this year. Um, can someone, um, uh, Jody, you haven't spoken in a while, not to pick on you, but if you could, you know, pick up on that on objectivity and, you know, you know, perceptions of journalists being having opinions and personal views as opposed to being completely objective. I think that, first of all, there are a lot of different kinds of journalists and always have been, right? There are journalists who are totally transparent about what they think, you know, and who, like, they're not hiding, they, their reporting has given them a very strong perspective, and they're not hiding the ball on that. Like, what makes my colleague Nicole Hannah-Jones special is that her reporting has led her to have this really powerful view of, you know, school segregation, of American history, of the way race has played out in America. And part of what makes her such a compelling thinker is that she has a, you know, she has a, she has a, she has a theory of the case. You know, she has a way of analyzing the world and that's part of why uh, people want to hear from her. But then there, were, but then there are journalists who, who, you know, practice their work, but she's also a magazine journalist. She has more leeway, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are journalists who, um, you know, practice a completely different kind of journalism. And sometimes that's because that's what the story um, is, calls for. If you were reporting a story on a really complicated issue of medical ethics, um, like I, I just, I'm finishing my colleague, um, Sherry Fink, who writes about medical disasters, wrote this yeah. incredible, incredible book called Five Days at Memorial about um, a hospital under siege uh, during Hurricane Katrina. And, you know, I had read her magazine article on it, and I, I took a long time to finally read her book. I think it was this current period of medical disaster that drew me to it. It's one of the best works of nonfiction I've ever read. And part of what's so beautiful is the restraint with which she writes. And even, you know, the, 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 famous climax of the book is that these doctors end up euthanizing some of the patients that are stuck at Memorial. Mm. On the one hand, you can't finish the book thinking that the doctors should have done this. It was pretty clearly wrong. And, and I think that Sherry's facts, uh, uh, you know, when you look at it in retrospect, I, I can't imagine anybody reading this book and thinking that these doctors really should have taken matters into their own hands. But the book asks a more interesting question, which is, when we really recreate what happened and we go back to the desperation and the confusion that this medical staff the, and the, the lack of disaster preparation um, that these medical professionals were working in, can any part of us understand what they did and why? And, and how should they be judged for it? You know, was this a criminal act? Should they lose their licenses? Should they be allowed to practice medicine again? And that's where, and, you know, and I think that reading the book, you can't tell what Sherry thinks. I don't know what Sherry thinks, but it's the kind of book that makes you want to stay up all night arguing with friends, uh, you know, over um, what should have happened, what, you know, what would I have done in that situation if it were my grandmother who had been euthanized, would I have wanted these doctors and nurses to go to prison, even though, by the way, there was there was no malicious intent, right? I mean, they, they were scrambling in a disaster situation. And I feel like ultimately that's, you know, I think that Sherry was incredibly objective and scrupulous in that situation because she gave, she gave everybody involved, you know, the respect of not jumping to the conclusions. And she wrote the book in a way that promotes conversations, I think, in, instead of instead of ends it. Um, and so anyway, so I, I, I think these are different. I think these are different tools. And I also, I don't know, I think you can combine them in your own work in really powerful and effective ways. I think that in our me too reporting what Megan and I strove for was to be really fair to everybody involved, including Weinstein, which was kind of like a nightmare because trying to be fair to somebody who's attacking you is um, is really like a very tricky yeah. thing to do. Um, but, yeah. at, but part of the reason we were trying to be so fair to him is that we knew mm -hmm. we had powerful material and we wanted it to be irrefutable. We wanted the story to be meticulous. 
we didn't mm. want it to be about what Jody and Megan think about this whole series of events, but we wanted it to be about the women's stories and the, trem the tremendous amount of evidence we had gathered yeah. uh, to back it up. And if we had, if we had led with ourselves, I don't think, you know, or with our own views about, you know, sexual assault or whatever, I don't think, uh, I don't think the story would have had nearly as much impact. Hmm. So can I, uh, I just want to jump in for one second with a very direct, just directly to the, to that question. I think it was Joel's sure. question. You asked. I, um, I just personally, and this is just me, I, I don't do cable news. Um, and I haven't for years. It's not for lack of requests. I do meet the press sometimes, but I don't, which, you know, I think is pretty good. It's just a policy for me mainly because I don't want to be a hypocrite. There's a whole bunch of reasons. It takes too much time. I find it vapid and all the rest of it, but mainly because I, I do believe, and this is to the heart of the question, that no single innovation or advent in our industry has been more damaging or deleterious to the credibility and trust of the American media than the parade of punditry on cable television. I think it was absolutely catastrophic for our industry. I've written as much. It's now morphed into, you know, the whole culture of it has morphed into Twitter and online where I think it does just exponentially more damage. But mm -hmm. if I could wave a magic wand, uh, particularly if I could have gone back in time, but if I could wave a magic wand and change something, it wouldn't be that journalists don't have opinions. I got no problem with it. As Jody says very eloquently, those of us who come by our opinions through hard won reporting are being honest with ourselves and with our readers. Uh, yeah. But the constant parade of people talking about things they know nothing about in an effort to score cheap fame has done more to damage the industry that I care most about in my life than any other single thing we've done, including various scandals that we all know about that have tarnished the reputations of media organizations and, in, and including the tilt toward ideology in exchange for readers. Uh, I really think it's problematic. Agree. Mm. Yeah, like no, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, you have your opinion, obviously, and uh, but as long as you know it's uh, fair and balanced, as as we say, otherwise you come to countries uh, like, for example, like you were asking me about other countries, like in North Korea, when we uh, as a media company do reporting on North Korea, you know, and they literally check every single word we write and like no even single opinion can be inserted there you know even uh, like a, an adjective that is used uh, will be looked upon and they will try to us to remove it because you cannot express any opinion any uh, insert any of your feeling there at all um, and uh, obviously here you, know, you have to be balanced and fair but you can still do opinions as well yeah, um, I, I appreciate you all responding to that. We have a, a second question by um, Evan Bliss. He says, do news organizations like the New York Times, Washington, Washington Post, ETC, have a, any responsibility for the state of journalism? That is, it feels, um, that is, it feels hyper-partisan and the general public's trust in news organizations are diminishing. And I mean, I must at this point, I mean, the conversation is getting really good, but I also have to be aware of the time we have four more minutes. So if you guys could just give, if one person could give um, a short response to that, uh, because I do want to ask a final question of you guys. I'll, I'll give a 20 second response. Yes, we do have a responsibility. <laughs> yes, it's hyper-partisan. Uh, now I, I'm sympathetic to it because I think it's been, um, you know, and I've been part of it as well. I think it's called for, I think we've had to stand up in opposition to an extraordinarily difficult uh, and, you know, moment in American politics that threatens a lot of the core values that are core to both our industry and the country and the democracy as well. But, um, but we've also mm. chased traffic and we've also, uh, and we've also allowed that to become, I think, a very pervasive norm. Uh, and yes, it concerns me, and we do have a responsibility to to not to not be reflexively ideological. Matt, I'm very impressed. That was very close to 20 seconds. Um, I should I, go on I, cable TV. I can <laughs> I can time. <laughs> I appreciate that. So the last question that because we are really needing to wrap up is if each of you could also you know do a Matt a 20 seconder 
what one piece of advice would you have for people across the globe when it comes to finding new sources to trust? Because I think that would be a good note for us to end on what like just people across the globe, not just in the US in terms of just one piece of advice when it comes to finding new sources to trust. Anyone? I think you just like look with skepticism, you know, whatever you read and be more of a skeptic and then try to um, dissect what you are reading, you know, based on, you know, like as, as I mentioned before, where the facts come from, what the source of the information that you are reading, starting from their web, you know, like URL, you know, like this, the website and what they say about us and just be, be more diligent um, before you um, try to see what, like where the news are coming from. That's great, Natasha. Thank don't, you. Don't read the main business daily. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, and, and also I would say, I would say really think about the sourcing and the veracity of what you're reading before you share it with other people. Don't be the person who shares something that's not true. Don't be the super spreader. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think it's a multiple source thing. I agree. I agree with everyone else. I think it's uh it's just not a world where you can read one thing anymore. You know, the paper landed in your driveway once by a time. You took it out of the driveway, you read it and gave yourself a half hour. You knew it was going on in the world. We just don't live that way anymore. Uh, you can't you can't be responsible or informed by one source. Um, you don't have to read them all terribly deeply, but you have the internet at your fingertips. You can serve. I just think we all have to understand the landscape has changed and we have to be promiscuous readers. I think that's a great place to end. And thank you so much, Matt, Natasha, Jody, for your time. I'm going to hand over to Kate. This has been incredible. And I think everyone in the um, audience who's been watching is, you know, really appreciative of you guys taking this time. This has been insightful for me and I'm sure everybody else. Um, and I'll hand over to Kate at this point, who's just going to um, wrap it up for us. Yes, I just want to second that. Thanks again. Thank you, Matt, Jody, Natasha, and Zoe for such a terrific program, such a needed conversation at this time, and especially taking this time in such a busy season for you all. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us tonight. Um, if you're interested in volunteering and leadership opportunities in the alumni community at Columbia, visit alumni.columbia.edu to get involved with your regional club, your shared interest group, alumni voices, and so much more. Um, or explore volunteer opportunities on volunteer.alumni.columbia.org. You can also contact your school alumni association for opportunities at the school level. They'll be happy to connect you. Next week, Columbia's at home. Columbia at home will be why leadership matters for social justice, inclusion, and anti-racism with Obama Foundation scholar, Ana Maria Gonzalez Ferrero, Bianca Jones Marlin, the assistant professor of psychology and neuroscience and principal investigator at Columbia Zuckerman Institute, John Levy, civil rights attorney, and moderator, Alilia Bundles, Columbia trustee and journalist. That will be October 28th from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. You can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Once you register, you can download the app, which is super helpful, or visit the online event guide to watch the programs you've missed, including the opening session with Columbia trustees. Thank you all again for joining Columbia at Home tonight. Take care. <laughs>